you may be seated. And as you're seated, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the New Testament book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we've come tonight, we've made it to the last chapter of Paul's final book that he wrote. And God has taught us many, many things. And I hope they've been a help to you. I trust they have. It's been a help to me. And I don't know about you, but I want to finish my course well. We won't, we won't get there to that part of chapter 4 tonight. But Paul finished well. Uh, the, the fight that he fought was a good fight. As, and we talked about Thursday night. It's not talking about how, how well a boxer fights. You know, we think about fighting. And it might be wrong, but I enjoy watching a good boxing match. I enjoy watching mixed martial arts. It, it might be a bad thing to admit, but I, I like it. Uh, it's fun to watch because I'm not the one getting hit in the face. And uh, you know, after you know, after these fights, these uh, the, the commentators they come and, and they do these interviews with. With the fighters, and they would, and and the fighters say, you know, I fought a good fight. You know, I I got my jab to work. You know, I was able to keep them at bay. Uh, I did what I wanted to do. I fought a good fight, but that's not the kind of fight that Paul fought. Uh, the fight when when Paul makes a statement that he fought a good fight, he was confessing the truth that the fight that he fought was worth fighting. It's a good fight. It's worth it. And as we consider our lives tonight, Christians, I want you to understand that it's worth it. Sometimes in the midst of life's uh, tumultuous times, in in the 2020s of life, you know, we ask, we we question its worth. Is it worth it? Is it worth serving the Lord? Is it worth uh, getting up and and going to church? Is it worth reading my Bible? Is it... Is it worth telling other people about the Lord? Is it worth serving my God? And and friends, it is worth it. There's nothing greater you can do in your life and with your life than to serve the Lord. You and I, that's why we were created, to bring glory to God. We do so through our service, our lives lived for Him, our consecration, our sanctification, allowing God to take our lives and use them. And as we consider Paul, what a great vessel he was, wasn't he? And he talked about being a vessel of honor, even in, uh, in chapter number 2. He says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the Master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I want God to use my life for His glory. And I want to be a vessel that He can use. But I hope that you've enjoyed this book. As we come to chapter 4, it reminds me of of Romans chapter 12, just as Paul begins. Romans 12, of course, Paul begins by saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, right, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And Paul, he makes the statement, therefore, and why is it there? What is he talking about? What is he referencing? He's referencing everything that he has already stated. All of the the previously stated truth leading up to that point in the book of Romans, because because God is true, because the Word of God is, uh, is, is powerful, because the Gospel saves, because Jesus is God, because of all the things we have and enjoy in Christ. Paul writes, I beseech you therefore. We find a similar tone of urgency here. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, I charge thee therefore. Because of everything he's already stated in this letter, and he has stated much, hasn't he? The promises of God. The blessings of a pure conscience. Our need for sound words. The fact that we're to, to, to take the faith and commit it to others and teach others also. and We can be a good soldier. We can strive for masteries. We can endure all things. We have a, faith, a foundation of God which standeth sure. Says, I, I charge thee therefore. And if you're able, I invite you to stand with me tonight as you begin reading here in God's Word. 
We'll read together in chapter 4 and verses 1 through 5. Notice what the Bible says, beginning again in verse 1 of 2 Timothy 4. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, and his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Father, we thank you for your truth again tonight. And Lord, even as it states in the previous chapter, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Lord, it's profitable. And Lord, we're here tonight. We ask that your word would, would accomplish its work. You've promised us that it will not return void. So Father, we pray that you would speak to us from your word tonight. God, may we come ready and willing to hear and heed what the Scripture says, make right decisions and that would honor and glorify Christ. And Lord, may we not leave here as we came. May we leave here more like the Lord, Jesus Christ. Help us grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and understand the job that is at hand. Because of everything we have. Because of what you've given to us, God, we have a job to do. So let us rise up and work together as a church family. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Lord, help us, we pray. Speak to our hearts tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to a very powerful command. In verse number 2, there's three words that, that God has entrusted to our care. Three things, three words in this command. He tells us saying, preach the word. Preach the word. Because of everything we've seen in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2, and 3. It says, I charge thee therefore, preach the word. As we look in chapter 3, of course, we found last week that it was, it was rife and full of, of, of awful behavior of man. Again, in chapter 3, the Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, Blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unholy, unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. For, the, for of this sort they, uh, they are, for of this sort are they which creep in into houses and lead captivity, silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever, uh, ever learning and never able to come into the truth. We consider all the things that we, all the times in which we live. And if there's ever a time in which we are to, to preach the Word, now is the time. But we must not preach the Word unless you understand why we're preaching the Word. Or for whom we're preaching the Word. You know, I'm just as disappointed with society as the next person. But that's not why I preach the Word. You know what the word preach means in chapter, two, or in chapter 4 and verse 2? It means to herald. It means a public crier. A public crier. What is a public crier? In ancient days, those who were in authority had people walk the streets and lift their voices, proclaiming announcements, 
uh, proclaiming decrees, proclaiming their words so that the masses can hear. You and I are to be public criers. We are to herald forth, we are to proclaim the truth of the gospel. Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10. Holding your place there in Romans chapter 10, I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself, by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Friends, what is the word of reconciliation? This. In you and I, it is our responsibility to preach the word. This is the word of reconciliation. Notice what else the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse number, uh, verse number 20, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That is the word of reconciliation. That is the message, the Gospel message, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Not to be too repetitive from this morning, but that is the word we are to proclaim. And if we fail to proclaim the truth of God's Word, if we fail to preach the Word, then we've missed it completely. It's not our Word. It's God's Word. And He has entrusted it to our care. He's placed it in our charge. I charge thee. Preach the Word. And just as a public crier goes about and proclaims the the commands and words and speech of an earthly king, you and I are the public criers, the preachers of the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are His ambassadors. We are ambassadors for King Jesus, who has given us the Word. This is His Word. And He wants all to hear And if our gospel be hid, if we fail to preach it, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Turn to Romans chapter 10, if you would please. Romans chapter number 10. And notice what the Word of God says in verse... Number 9, it says, that If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Aren't you thankful for that? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew or, uh, and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Praise the Lord. God is not a despiser of man. He's not a respecter of persons. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach 
the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Friends, you and I, we are to preach the Word of God. We are to publicly proclaim. Reminded of what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse number 17, Paul writes, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the Gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, in verse 5, Paul writes, he says, For we preach not ourselves, Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Friends, we are to preach the Word of God. Tonight, as we consider the responsibility that God has given us, there are three lessons we learn. Notice the first truth, first lesson, is the fact that we will all stand before the Lord. Why must I preach the Word? Why must I be faithful to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible says back in chapter 4 and verse 1 of 2 Timothy that Jesus Christ, that God and Jesus Christ will judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. We're going to stand before God and give account of what we've done with this. I'm going to say something, and I don't want you to, I hope it doesn't sound harsh. I don't mean for it to. And if I come across that way, I apologize. But too many times we make this a game. It's not a game. It's heaven and hell. It's eternity. Church is not a game. It's not a good old boys club. It's not a country club. It's the church of the living God. The pillar and ground of the truth. This isn't something that we ought to just haphazardly involve ourselves with, something that we should completely give ourselves to. Because we're going to stand before the Lord and give account of what we've done with this. Reminded of the parable of the talents. The Lord had three servants and He called them to Himself and he, he divided up the talents amongst the three. He gave one five, I believe He gave one two and the other one. And He went into the far country. And these men, to whose care He placed His treasure, He gave them charge and they were to go out and invest it and cause it to grow. The first man doubled it. The second man, he added to his as well. But that third one, huh, he missed the point completely. And he took that, took that treasure and he went out in the backyard and buried it. When the Lord returned, He said, well, you could have at least taken it and put it in the bank. Or it would draw interest so I could have it with usury upon my return. You know what we do too often? We bury this. We bury the book. We hold on to it. We don't preach it. You, you've got the answer. Do you realize that? 
Does it ever dawn, uh, dawn on us as we go throughout our daily lives? You know, we, we turn on CNN. Oh, maybe we don't. Don't turn on CNN. Uh, you know, we turn on all these cable news networks. We, we read the headlines. And we become so distraught that our countenance is changed by the lunacy of man. And it never dawns on us that we've got the answer. We hold on to it. We hide it. We go through life. I'm going to be an undercover Christian, you know. I'm, I'm going to be here. I'm just going to, I'm going to go to church on Sundays. I don't want, really want my neighbors to know about uh, my beliefs. Uh, you know, we're going to keep all of these things private. I, I, can't, I can't mix business with my faith. I can't mix family with my faith. I can't do any of these things. We're foolish. Do you realize that this is who we are? At least it ought to be. Why are you ashamed of it? Look back in Romans, if you would please. Romans chapter 10. I shouldn't have turned so quickly. Romans chapter 10. Look at what the Word of God says. In verse number 11, he says, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him, what? Shall not be ashamed. Are you ashamed of it? Are you ashamed? We say no, but we act like it most days. Do you realize we're going to stand before the Lord and give account of what we do with this? Sound doctrine. The foundation of God that standeth sure. Turn your Bibles, if you would please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and notice what the Bible says in verse number 5. The Bible says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. For the down payment of salvation, of eternity, being the Holy Spirit of God Himself in your hearts. The Bible says, Therefore we are always confident and uh, knowing that whilst we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear. Circle the word all. There in verse number 10. There is not one person in this world that will escape the judgment. We will all be judged by the Lord. The lost will stand before Him at the great white throne judgment. At the end of His millennial kingdom, right prior to eternity future. It's a judgment of condemnation. The Bible tells us, Plainly, that whoever is not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. And that is the second death. And those of us who know the Lord, I praise God that I do. I'm thankful for that. I will escape that judgment of condemnation and stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat which is not a judgment of condemnation, but rather one of commendation. But that doesn't mean I won't suffer loss. The Bible says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That every one, every one, Notice the emphasis that God places, not everyone, 
everyone. Not everyone in general, but everyone specific. Everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Friends, you and I are responsible for this. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Do we believe it? Do you believe that? Do you believe that you will one day stand before the Lord at the judgment? Do you believe it? Belief affects behavior. Do we believe it at an intellectual level? Well, I know that the Bible says it. But do you believe it in your heart? There's a difference between a general knowledge and a dynamic life change. And the Lord wants our behavior to change based upon what we have and what we know. Friends, we're to preach the Word. We are to proclaim God's truth. We are to proclaim His message. Why? Because we're going to stand before Him one day and give account of everything we do, whether it's good or bad. Notice the second reason we proclaim why we preach the Word Back in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we find the world is ever turning from the truth. The world is ever turning from the truth. Look again in, in verse 2, it says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Mark that word doctrine. In verse 15 of chapter 3, the Bible says that from a a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It's what's right. It's what is true. You know, it's not hard today to turn on the radio, except for 7.30 on Sunday mornings on 98.7 FM and AM 1430. And find false doctrine? It's everywhere. We've brought the world into the church. We've made the church a business structure. marketing the church. We ought to simply be preaching the gospel. We've allowed neo-evangelicalism. We've allowed the emergent church, new evangelicalism, to creep into the church. We wonder where God's power is. having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Look what the Bible says in verse, verse number 3, 2 Timothy chapter 4. It says, For the time will come, and may I say it now is, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Fables! What's it like? Uncle Remus? Is that, is that the correct author? 
All the little fables, right? Jack and Jill ran up the hill, you know. People have a better time reading that than they do the Word of God. Fables. Something fictitious. Oh, I can't. I can't. I can't read that version of the Bible. Well, I'm sorry. It's the only one worthwhile. Well, I don't like that music. Was there too much scripture in it? Yeah. Well, I like the music, it makes me feel good. It's not about how you feel. And it never has been. It's about what is true and what is right. It's about what pleases God or displeases the Lord. And friends, we must be on guard. How we live our life, what we allow... Pray that as a church, we love the truth more than we love a location. We love truth more than we love acquaintance. We, we live, friends, look, we, they, look at what the Bible says. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. People want to go to places that make them feel good. Right? That that their toes don't get stepped on where God is not working in their hearts. They can crank the music up and tone the Bible down. That's not what God's given us to do. What has God called us to do? He's called us to preach the Word. He's called us to preach the Word of God, to proclaim the truth of God's Word. Why? Because there's a time, and and even today, people will not, they do not want to listen to it. And And there are people, professed Christians. These are professed Christians. What did, what did they say? What did Jesus say? They'll come to me and say, oh, did I not do this, that, or the other thing in your name? And the Lord will answer them, depart from me. You workers of iniquity. I don't even know you. Most people who go to churches, I'm not saying that everybody who goes to these churches is lost. But I would say the majority of them are. And they've, de- they've been deceived. They've been deceived. And you can turn on, you can turn on the television and you can watch these, evan- these proclaimed evangelists, Joseph Princes, and these, well, what's his name down the road? Parsley. You can, you can watch all of these guys. You know what they're doing? They're seducers. They're seducers. And they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. But they've got such a great following. Yeah. Sad, isn't it? And they're subtle. They're slick, man. Friends, we must be on guard. We must guard our hearts. We must learn to think critically for ourselves. We must read the Scriptures. We must search the Scriptures. We ought to be Bereans. That search the scriptures daily. 
Not, tell, not allow some, some televangelist or uh, what we ought to believe and what we ought not to believe or what, we, what some writer put in a book. Anybody can write a book! But I'm here to tell you that God wrote a book. God wrote a book. And the best part about it is the author lives in my heart. And if I come to a place that I don't understand, a place that's hard, I can ask the author himself. And he can speak to my heart. He can interpret it to me. The eyes of my understanding would be enlightened. That He'd open my eyes and He allows me to behold marvelous things from His law. The Bible says, they shall turn away their ears from the truth. I don't even want to hear it. She'll be turned unto fables. 2020 is a year of fables. Mark my word. The Bible says, turn to Colossians chapter 2, if you would, please. Colossians chapter number 2. And notice what the Bible says in verse number 8. Actually, let's begin in verse 6. The Bible says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Jesus is the answer, people. He's the answer. So walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware. Beware. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The world is full of philosophy. It's full of vain deceit. It's full of empty tradition. All the rudiments, all the tricks... All the plays on words, not after Christ. You got to beware. Beware. Jesus said, "Be sober." Well, Peter said, "Be sober. Be vigilant." Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We've got to be on guard against these things. In 1 Timothy chapter number 6, in verse 20 and 21, the Bible says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, and notice in oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred, erred concerning the faith. What's the answer? You know, sometimes we fix our eyes on the wrong thing. And it's easy for us to, to get on our soapbox and preach against all these different things. But I ask you to keep my eyes on the Lord and keep preaching the Word. What is the only solution to false doctrine? This book. There's a bunch of reprobates out there (laughs) that work to discourage people, sway people away from the Word of God. All kinds of false religious systems that feed and prey on people who don't know the truth. Christians, we need we need to immerse ourselves in the word of God. 
Remember, our goal is to be a biblical Christians, right? You can never know too much Bible. You can med- never meditate too much on too much Scripture. You can never meditate too often on Scripture. You will never memorize the wrong Bible verse. We need God's Word. Truth. Sound doctrine. You say, well, Pastor, how do I know what sound doctrine is? You just read the book for yourself, my friend. So a lot of these people, what they'll do, we'll park on the charismatics for a minute. They'll take one verse of Old Testament Scripture written to the Jews concerning the millennial kingdom and develop an entire false theology from that verse. It was never written to the church. It wasn't addressed to us. It's not not for us. God wrote it to us, but it's not for us. It doesn't apply to us. Friends, we've got to be careful. Sound doctrine. But notice lastly, it's what God's given us to do. It is what God has given us to do. Look what the Bible says in verse 5, back in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul writes, he says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, it says, make full proof of thy ministry. You know what that statement means? Make full proof of thy ministry? Do what God's given you to do. Just do what God's given you to do, and it's going to be okay. Do what God's given you to do. What has God given us to do? Preach the word. You know, there's going to be afflictions. Paul spoke of them in chapter 3. The afflictions that rose him at Antioch, and at Lystra, Iconium. There's going to be afflictions in life. There's going to be seasons of difficulty in the Christian life. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's part of it. I'm sorry. It's the Christian life. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Lord will see you through, just as he did Paul, how Paul was delivered by the Lord. The Bible says the Lord delivered him from them all. Make full proof of thy ministry. Keep at it. Don't give up. Don't allow yourself to be discouraged because the Lord's on your side. You're on the Lord's side. Turn your Bibles to Colossians as we close. Colossians chapter number 4. And notice, as Paul brings this letter to a close, he mentions a man in passing. Where one would think he just mentions him in passing. It's the only time we find his name written in Scripture. But it's there for a reason. A man by the name of Archippus. What is the Lord's instructions to this man? Verse 17 The Bible says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Next time we meet in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we find that Paul finished his course. He says, Hey, listen, I kept the faith. It's worth it. Don't quit. Be determined. Don't give up. Preach the Word. Be faithful to God's Word. After all, He's entrusted it to us. He's charged us with it. May God help us be faithful and committed, determined. Because we're going to stand before Him.
And the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. People are turning away from the truth, left and right. Darker the night, the brighter the light. It's our job to stand firm with love and compassion, with conviction on the truth of Scripture. And let's finish the job God's given us to do. Let's not quit. Let's not give up. Let's be everlastingly at it. Let's work till Jesus comes.